Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. In Revelation 19.10, At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Today is the first Sunday of the Advent season, the birth of our Lord. His first coming is prophesied through Scripture and fulfilled historically. In many parts of the world, throughout the month of December, there will be reenactments of the nativity scene, and the focus will be on Bethlehem, angels, shepherds, wise men, Joseph, Mary, and of course, the baby Jesus in a manger. There will be cantatas and pageants and plays, musicals, caroling, services, and celebrations concerning the birth of Christ. For many people, this is a, a seasonal event that comes and goes. There are traditions and parties and dinners, gift giving, and all to commemorate the season, intertwined with even eclipsing the real meaning of Christmas was the commercial greed. Santa, flying reindeer, and other tales written into the history of lives and passed on from generation to generation. Furthermore, for multitudes of people, Advent is a reminder of fulfilled prophetic promises from God the Father. Prophecy is the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God, the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means, or the foretelling of the will of God, whether with reference to the past, the present, or the future. Prophecy is one of the functions of a biblical prophet, it is a proclamation of some future event that is beyond the power of mortal man to foresee, discern, or even speculate. And there is one ultimate theme that connects the prophetic declarations that are penned throughout the pages of the Old and the New Testaments. And apostles referred to this theme throughout their ministries. The theme is that the prophecy of Scripture proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. In Acts 5.42, we read, And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Acts 18.5, While Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. The Greek translation of the Hebrew word rendered Messiah or anointed one is the official title of our Lord occurring, I'm sorry, occurring 555 times in the New Testament. It denotes that he was anointed or consecrated to his great redemptive work as prophet and priest, king and Lord of all. What proof did the apostles have to back up their testimony that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, all messianic prophecy was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. In John 1, and 45, we read, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, I have shared this over and over throughout the years, but I actually put it on your bulletin so you can use this as a, a evangelical or evangelistic uh, 
tool. He says the Old Testament contains over 300 references to the Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus, which he says establishes the fact of God, authenticates the deity of Jesus, and proves the inspiration of the Bible. Uh, the Bible. Mc McDowell lists 61 specific messianic prophecies and shows how they were fulfilled hundreds of years after they were spoken. And he points out that Peter Stoner, in his book, Science Speaks, says that according to scientifically accepted laws of probability, the odds against just eight of the prophecies being fulfilled are one chance in 10 to the 17th power. One chance in 10 to the 17th power. Of just eight of those 300 prophecies being fulfilled in one person. In Revelation 19.10, it says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, the testimony, the evidence, or the record given, the witness, the official or the office committed to the prophet of testifying concerning future events. And the spirit is God's power and agency. In other words, the angel was equating the fact that he had received this spirit of prophecy and was not superior to John because John had received the testimony of Jesus to preach him among the Gentiles. In other words, the commission containing such a testimony that John possessed was equal to the gift of the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony concerning Jesus because he is, as John would later declare, the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So this brings us to our first point on your outline. The spirit of prophecy was to promote the arrival and work of the Messiah and to prepare the world for his advent. Again, there are some 300 plus prophecies in the Bible that speak of Jesus. What tribe he would come from, his birthplace, the dates of his birth and death, who his forerunner would be, John the Baptist, his career in ministry, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation, the kingly magnificent of his second coming that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed by a friend. He was accused by false witnesses. He was mocked and beaten. His hands and feet were pierced. His side was pierced. He was ridiculed. People uh, gambled away his garments. He agonized by thirst. No bones were broken. Buried in a borrowed tomb, that his beard would be plucked out, that they'd place a crown of thorns, and we can keep going and going and going. Letter A, God told man before it happened so that he might believe after it happened. God told man, revealed it through his word before it even happened so that he might believe after it happened. Most people don't even investigate the Bible. They've never taken it and torn it apart and looked at these prophecies. They just push it aside because some professors said it's an antiquated book written by a bunch of crazy people. So they just push it aside and they say it's just written by men. It's not a big deal. No, you, you look at prophecy. There's not another book in the history of the world that has prophecy like this in which things were revealed about one person hundreds of years before he was born and then fulfilled in that one person. Nothing at all like it in the world. And yet people quest, question the validity of the Bible. Prophecy alone. 
as Josh McDowell says, that's evidence that demands a verdict. See, in our world today, there are multitudes of people, including many who call themselves believers, who do not even believe the Bible is divinely inspired. Therefore, it does not bring life to them based on their unbelief. Because Jesus is thought of as just a figure from history. He's not believed in as the Savior and Lord of all. In reality, this unbelief is no different than, when, than what possessed the religious leaders from days of old. And this brings us to number two on our outline. Jesus came into this world to bring men life. To bring men true life. In John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. This is Jesus speaking. You diligently study the scriptures, he told the Pharisees, because you think that by them you possess eternal life. You can memorize all you want. These are the scriptures that testify about me, Jesus said. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. When Jesus said you refuse to come to me to have life, he was speaking to the religious leaders of the day, the very ones who were entrusted with the word of God. Those who were responsible for giving the, 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 an expounding the teaching of the word of God, which is life. Yet they were refusing to come in to Jesus, to believe in him, who was the very word of God. They were refusing to believe that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah. And this is because they were spiritually blind. They were still searching for a Messiah that over the years they had envisioned, one that they shaped and formed into their own image which would best suit their purposes of the day. They did not realize their own lostness. They did not realize their own need of a Savior to forgive them from their sins. Why? They were self-righteous. Their deeds, their works. What do we need a Savior for? We need a Savior to deliver us from Roman rule. The word of God had become something that they interpreted, not something that was personal and life-changing. Dallas Willard said, the Bible is, after all, God's gift to the world through his church, not to the scholars. It comes through the life of his people and nourishes that life. Its purpose is practical, not ac academic. An intelligent, careful, intensive, but straightforward reading, that is one not governed by obscure and faddish theories or by a mindless orthodoxy is what it requires to direct us into life in God's kingdom. Any other approach to the Bible, I believe, conflicts with the picture of the God that all agree emerges from Jesus and his tradition. Jesus came to bring spiritual life through renewal, redemption, revival, forgiveness, salvation. He came to bring men the hope of eternal life, life everlasting, a life which is to be with him where he is. And Jesus came to bring abundant life to people in the here and now, a life of meaning, of purpose, of joy, of love, one that glorifies God the Father and blesses others. You see, if a person considers the Bible to be worthy of searching into, would careful study... And if they search through the scriptures for obtaining and applying answers for everyday life, they will come to believe the Bible to be much more than some random academic book used for tradition and orthodoxy. When they search with an open heart, they will conclude it's supernatural. And when they come to this understanding, they will experience life because they will put their faith in Christ as their Savior, their Lord, their guide in their ever-present help in times of trouble. 
And this leads us to number three. Jesus came into the world to be the one and only personal God for the whole world. Personal. We can tend to focus on the obvious, salvation, eternal life, doctrine, but we can lose the reality that Jesus came, entered into every, our everyday world. He was born into this world, placed in a feeding trough, a manger. And he grew up in a family, went to synagogue. He had chores to do. He worked in the family business. In every way, he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. But nevertheless, he was human, with human needs. And because of this, he is able to sympathize with you and with me. Hebrews 4.15, the writer says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. This means your Lord and your God. Jesus, the creator, the sustainer of this world, knows right where you are. He knows just what you are feeling. He knows exactly what your struggles are. He knows your hurts, your frustrations, your failures, your hopes, and your dreams. You see, number four, Jesus came into this world to meet you in the midst of your everyday life. To comfort, to guide, to uplift, to strengthen, to empower, to encourage, to give you life. Psalm 119, 76, 77. May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me that I might live. For your law is my delight. The comfort we receive is from the comforter, the spirit of Jesus, the person of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth. Paul said in his second letter to the Corinthians, praise be to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. He is so personal. He was born to you. A few years ago, my wife asked me for some commentaries for a lesson that she was preparing for a women's ministry. So I set her up with seven or several commentaries and, and, and a couple of my, my uh, favorite Bible software programs. And after about 20 minutes, she told me that she was going to just use her Bible. She said that she felt like some of the commentaries were stretching and, and searching for theological meaning and missing the heart of the matter or the heart of where a woman is. Of course, my first thought was, I don't understand what she means. But after a couple of hours, I came downstairs to my office and entered the living room where she was studying. And she asked me if I wanted to hear what she had written down so far. I sat there with tears in my eyes as she read her commentary on a couple of verses. It was crystal clear to me that Jesus was meeting her right where she was. God was speaking to her in those verses of scripture. And what I heard and what I saw was the God of relevance. He came into her world and was moving her soul, was comforting her heart, and also revealing to me that doctrine and theology, they're important, but at times they can obscure the obvious, which is that God speaks to us right where we are, that the power and beauty of his word gives us life in every situation. He came into her world and was moving her soul, was comforting her heart and also revealing to me that doctrine and theology can obscure the obvious, which is that God speaks to us right where we are. And that is the power and the beauty of his word, which gives us life. Leads us to letter A. 
The spirit of prophecy testifies to Jesus as being Savior and Lord, but also of his all-consuming love and concern for man. Yes, Jesus came to save men and women from their sins. Yes, Jesus came to give eternal life. But Jesus also came to bring us life today. Life this very moment, abundant life, new life, purposeful life. Life to get us through today and another day. Be it ordinary, mundane, or overwhelming. Jesus is here with us. Not some of the time, but all of the time. And when you want to hear him, all you have to do is listen to the spirit of prophecy. Because it is his word. It is his Testimony Again, Dallas Willard says, I think we finally have to say that Jesus' enduring relevance is based on his historical proven ability to speak to, to heal and empower the individual human condition. He matters because of what he brought and what he still brings to ordinary human beings, living the ordinary lives and coping daily with their surroundings. He promises wholeness of their lives. In sharing our weakness, he gives us strength and imparts through his companionship, a life that has the quality of eternity. He comes where we are and he brings us the life we hunger for, to be the light of life and to, to deliver God's life to women and men where they are and as they are is the secret of the enduring revelance of Jesus. You see, Jesus, number five, came into the world to be our constant companion. In good times or in the worst of times, in joy or in sorrow, in health or in sickness, in peace or in war, in freedom or in captivity, everywhere, at any time, the Lord is our constant remedy. For some, this is hard to understand, yet for others, it is a reality that they, it, they can't deny it. John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Again, the writer of Hebrews says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Matthew 28, 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Chaplain Ray Stubby, who served in the Vietnam War, was asked by a group of university students as to the spirituality of the men he served with in combat. He said that two dozen former grunts, Marines, had later become ministers. And we on, he went on to say what he learned from these men. In their conversations with me, they said that they were aware of the presence of God precisely in the midst of the terrors and horrors of war. God is with us precisely in the dark times of our life, in the horror and terror of the war that we were in. God is on the cross identifying with us when we face death. We have peace in the original sense of shalom, which is not the absence of conflict, but the presence and blessing of God precisely in the battle. Amazing. The Advent, letter A, the Advent of Jesus means that he was manifested to us. 1 John 1, 1 through 4, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which, it, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus. And these things we write to you that your joy might be full. The word manifested presupposes existence prior to manifestation. In the man of Nazareth, there was manifestation of one who had existed long before the man of Nazareth. The incarnation was not an act by which God began to be in any single sense. It was not an act by which God came into nearness to human life. It was an act by which God manifested his nearness to human life. And by which manifestation he was able to do in human life and in human history things he could not have done apart from that self-same method 
of manifestation. To this end was the Son of God manifested. G. Campbell Morgan. You think about the imp implications of the manifestation of Christ, the incarnation, the advent of our Lord, then we know that because of the manifestation of Jesus Christ, God has been revealed. John 17, 6, I have magnified your name, Jesus said in his prayer to the Father. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. I have manifested your name. We know that because of the manifestation of Christ, our sins have been taken away. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, John wrote in his first epistle. And we know that because of the manifestation of Christ, God's love can be known and experienced. 1 John 4, 8 through 11, God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God had sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He was the atonement for our sins. What great love our father has for us. And letter B, because of the manifestation of Christ, truth can be known. Say that again. Because of the manifestation of Jesus Christ, because he was in this world, truth can be known. He told Pontius Pilate, the reason I have come to this earth is to testify to the truth. You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And then he, Jesus said this, everyone on the side of truth listens to me, listens to Christ, accepts his teachings, builds their life upon the teachings of Jesus Christ, and you know truth when you do that. Outside of that, you do not have truth. And that is why I, there is so much conflict in our world today. People are trying to live life without the gift of life, and you cannot do it. You'll live in confusion and in spiritual poverty. But truth can be known. Let her see, because of the manifestation of Christ, the works of the devil are destroyed. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now that's being done. As I speak, the devil's been judged. He's been beaten by Christ. The resurrection, the ascension, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in the hearts and lives of believers, the works of the enemy have been undone in so many people. But the evidence of evil is still here. He is still working because he has not been sentenced as of yet. His final judgment will come. And he knows his time is short. We know that the work of Satan is the total opposite of the life that Christ brings. The devil seeks to destroy, to promote darkness and hatred and murder and lies, for he is a murderer and he is the father of lies. We just look at war and what it produces, false religions and what that produces. And the fruit of it, oppression, devastation, it's everywhere. Outside of the life that Christ came to bring man, it's confusion and chaos and sin of every kind. But Christ came to destroy, to dissolve, 
to bring to an end, to reduce to ruin and to tear down. That same word is used for what happened to the ship that Paul was sailing on as a prisoner. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. Broken up, dissolved, broken to pieces, loosened, scattered, totally wrecked. Jesus was manifested to do a work in human history, the result of which should be that the works of the devil would lose their consistency. And as Jesus conquered death and redeemed man, the ultimate destruction of the devil will take place in the near future. But for now, there is something that you and I have been entrusted with, something that the devil cannot stand against, something that defeats the devil and puts him to flight and gains for you an incredible victory until you are brought home to glory. But is also something that carries with it a responsibility in action, which you've been empowered to do. Number six, New Testament believers are to hold to the testimony of Jesus with all our hearts. We are to hold to the testimony of Jesus with all our hearts. Revelation 19.10, I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. We see that phrase, word of God and the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 1, Revelation 6.9, word of God and the testimony they had maintained. 12.17, they kept the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Acts, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Testify means to attest to, to affirm, to witness. 1 John 5, 8 through 12, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony of God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The testimony which proceeds from Jesus is the imparting of the spirit of prophecy. Again, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. There's a slogan that the Red Cross used in the past when trying to recruit blood donors. It was this, give the gift of life. You've been giving the gift of life because Jesus gave his blood. You see, the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus lives within you. Use your gift for God's glory, for your victory, and to destroy the works of the devil.